Welcome back to the leading edge of integrative mental health. I'm your host, Lisa Dale Miller. Please review and subscribe to the Groundless Ground podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, YouTube, Radio.com, TuneIn, iHeartRadio, and of course, find out more at GroundlessGround.com. I'm ready to go. How about you? Season four of the Groundless Ground podcast commences with a riveting, deep, and edgy dialogue with eco-psychologist Bill Plotkin on the soul journey which forges a true adult. And that fits in beautifully with the wild ride of the last four weeks in America. Trump's era of narcissism, criminality, and cruelty concluded with a swan song of insurrection, one for which he will soon be impeached for the second time and hopefully stripped of all post-presidential security and financial taxpayers-supported benefits. Then, January 20, brought President Biden's inauguration, a collective trauma healing event unlike anything America has ever seen. Each day since Joe Biden has diligently set about course correcting American government back onto the path of service and virtue. Thank you, President Biden, for modeling the best of America to a nation sorely in need of reminding. And now, on to the episode at hand. Soul initiation is an essential and hazardous spiritual journey that most modern cultures have forgotten. Visionary clinician Bill Plotkin discusses this mythopoetic, life-altering journey, which he beautifully explicates in his new book, The Journey of the Soul. Bill's humility and radical honesty shines through as he shares about his own soul journey and the involvement of the process to guide others through this mind, heart, and life-altering journey of preparation, descent, metamorphosis, and enactment. His book weaves information about this process and features an in-depth exploration and radically new understanding of Carl Jung's Red Book. May this episode inspire and awaken all who hear it. Bill Plotkin, it really is an honor to have you on the Groundless Ground podcast, and we're going to be discussing the book I've been waiting for. It's called The Journey of the Soul, A Field Guide for Visionaries, Evolutionaries, and Revolutionaries. Thank you, Lisa. Thanks for the invitation. You know, I usually start by having people kind of talk about who they are a little bit so the listeners can get to know you. And in this case, I actually think this is very important because you had your own experience that you are sort of guiding people to consider having in this book. And you had it at a very early point in your life. So I just thought you'd like to talk a little bit about yourself and a little bit about your journey. I often start by saying that I'm a spiritually oriented person, um, but I believe every human is born in such a fashion to be oriented towards the big questions of meaning and existence. But I'm one of maybe a minority that I didn't lose that awareness, but I didn't find um, the religion of my family to be helpful in any way whatsoever. Um, Judaism, at least the the way I was exposed to it, uh, didn't even touch any of the questions I had about life and about the world and about being human. By the time I got to college, I started exploring other spiritualities that were available on and off campus. This was in the late 60s, early 70s, so they tended to be Eastern-oriented spiritualities, Buddhism, both Zen and Tibetan, a few different kinds of yoga and Sufism and, and other things. And also the spiritual catalyst of entheogens, or at the time we call them psychedelics, which really shifted my consciousness as it did quite a few people at that time and before and after. And But there was something about my deepest questions about life that weren't getting answered by anything. It was in my mid-20s, I became aware of the work of Stephen Foster and Meredith Little of the School of Lost Borders in California. And they were very busy since 70s, I guess, in the work of reintroducing the pan-cultural vision fast to the Western world. And there's something about their work that uh, just, which I only had read about a little bit, resonated with me. So I began a correspondence with them through actual written letters. Among other things, they sent me a copy of their early handbook for their Western approach to the vision fast. 
I took that with me. And when I, I took myself out into the mountains for five days and fasted for four days and nights with the guidance of Stephen and Meredith through their handbook and had what I later ended up calling my, my first soul encounter. At the time, I didn't know what it was. I didn't even know what I was expecting. And I've written about that soul encounter in a couple of my books, including the most recent one. And I could tell the whole story, but just to get us rolling here, beginning of this podcast, let me just say that on the fourth day of my fast, I had an interaction with a spruce tree and a butterfly. And the butterfly ended up flying towards me, actually brushed the left side of my face with her wings. And as she went by, I heard her say in English, cocoon weaver, which was in the first few seconds, it was just kind of mildly interesting to me because there was so many other things going on in that alpine meadow at tree line, 11,500 feet in the Colorado mountains. But my life had been changed and it would never be the same. And I didn't experience what I was told primarily as information. It was more like um, some catalyst had just been dropped at the core of my psyche. And I, I could feel myself, my psyche starting to change. And it has continued to do so from that moment. I hope that's helpful as an initial introduction. It did exactly what I hoped it would do. I want to read a quote, and this is almost at the end of your book. Uh -huh. I think that your story illustrates why for you, the most important question facing us is what would it look like if we really loved this world, our more than human world, as fully as we're able, both individually and collectively. Mm. And that story is such an expression of this connection that you're pointing to throughout the book of our essential place in this world as a species and how that place actually has a kind of origin spirituality that it seems as though modern humans have lost connection with. Well, yeah, I agree. I, I take this radical position. I'm kind of putting the word radical in quotes this time. Every human is born to have a unique love affair with the world. That makes us not any different at all from everything else in the world. Everything is born from this world to enter this world and to take a unique place, to play a particular role in this world. And we're drawn into that role because we love this world. We were made for this world, this more than human world, this greater earth community. So I've come to believe that our deepest individual identity is wrapped up in or informed by the particular place or niche that we were born to take in this world. I ended up defining soul, I've def ended up defining so many keywords in a different way because my training early in religion and in Western psychology just ended up feeling like, no, this is missing the mark. I struggled with this word soul for a long time because we have these two spiritual words in our life, spirit or God and soul. Earlier in my life, I couldn't find anybody who made a clear distinction between even those two things. Eventually, in my 30s, I found James Hillman had, had written yeah. The Depth Psychologist wrote a really interesting chapter on the difference between soul and spirit. Typically, in the Western world, soul is defined in religious terms, like as a yeah. metaphysical object that maybe leaves the body when you die. And that may or may not be true, but it never was a particular interest to me. And as a psychologist, of course, I know that soul is often defined psychologically and often defined spiritually. But finally, it dawned on me, maybe just 20 years ago, I was going to have any success at defining it in a way that resonated, that I'd have to admit to myself as a psychologist that soul is not a psychological term, it's an ecological term. And that's why we've had such a hard time with it in psychology. Most psychologists, including depth psychologists, won't even define the word soul. So for me, it's very simple. Uh, the soul of a thing, soul of anything, is its unique ecological niche. Yes. The individual place it was born to take in this world. And when we discover that and are changed by that discovery as humans, we end up falling in love with the world in a way that we could never have imagined earlier to a depth that we didn't know was even possible. And um, the rest of our life becomes a dance of this particular love affair. And if it's true that there are so few contemporary humans who are exposed or to, or even are psychologically prepared for the journey of soul initiation. And that means there's not many humans who are loving the world in the way they were designed to love the world. 
to the greatest depths that they're designed to do so. And when you have a culture or society where the majority of people never fall into that love affair, then you end up with a world with the kinds of crises we have today. In the book, you describe or you define ecological niche. You say it's a distinctive role that any species plays in sustaining and enhancing life on the planet. Because you define it that way and because you're using the word love, there's so much to deconstruct here. Psychology has failed, I think, primarily because the body and the embodied existence of humans has been left out completely mm -hmm. of the mm -hmm. discipline. I feel as though you're pointing at is the best effort I've ever seen to integrate and bring back the embodied existence that human beings live moment to moment every single day, but pretty much don't pay attention to because we're so mind-centered, we're so conceptual. This is just the way we orient ourselves. Even yes. the distinction you make between soul, the way that it's mostly talked about, that is a concept. It's not actually an embodied reality. Right. When you talk about love, I feel I know what you're talking about. It's an act of service, this kind of mm -hmm. love. Yes. We are going to go to the difference between ego and soul. We'll go mm -hmm. there, I promise. Okay. But right now, the ego orientation around love for most people is ownership, owning something. You love the thing, you own the thing. This is our orientation, which I feel is counter, at least in some way opposite to the kind of love that you're actually talking about when you step into knowing your ecological niche, connecting, not conceiving of, but really connecting in an embodied way with how you fit in. You know, I don't know if I've been asked yet recently on a podcast to speak about love. And well, you've said the word love several times now I in have. terms of loving the world. One thing I mean is that it's a relationship to the world that brings us most alive. In that aliveness, we could say it has two streams or dimensions. One is that it's what motivates anyone to serve the world in the deepest way they can, as you have mentioned yourself there, Lisa. And also, it provides me my greatest fulfillment and joy in life because fulfillment and service are really two sides of the same coin, we could say. When I'm saying yes, and when I'm capable, I'm, I'm ready to say yes, and I've had the experiences that enable me to say yes to my love affair with the world, then I'm serving the world as deeply as I can and experiencing my greatest fulfillment. It's the kind of service to the world that not only offers my piece of sustaining life, but it, it actually allows me to do my little part in enhancing life. That's something I believe is true for everything, every life form on this planet, that it's meant to enhance life in its unique kind of way. There's some unique, I guess you would say, there's some particular aspects of humanity that make us different. I mean, everything has its unique place. One thing that makes us different, as far as we know, from every other species, is we have this particular mode of consciousness in which we are aware that we're aware, or that we know that we know, or um, conscious self-awareness, which is to say we have egos. And I don't use the word ego in the way it's often used in spiritual circles to mean a part of us that gets in the way of everything we got to get rid of. The ego is something that makes us human. We can't be human without it. So again, I just mean conscious self-awareness. My understanding of the problem with egos is not that we have egos, but that we have immature egos. And part of the goal of psychological and spiritual development is maturing and deepening our egos. Well, that may be true, but you might agree with me that the methodology around that maturing is not very mature. I do. I've been a psychologist for what over 40 years and I often remind myself, Lisa, you probably do this too, that psych psychology is relatively young, about 120 years or so at the most. And it came out of medicine back in the late 19th century, early 20th century. Psychologists used a medical model, or at least came out of that, which is something like problems in living are due to some kind of diseases, some kinds of syndromes, some kinds of pathology. We need to attend to symptoms and eliminate those problems. For me, that whole approach is just set us out the door in the wrong direction. Not that there haven't been some brilliant psychotherapists and approaches developed, but I think most all of them are missing something, which is that maybe 
the primary reason we have difficulties in living include such things as we haven't developed our innate human wholeness as much as we need to. We don't have the resources to address difficulties, challenges that everybody has in living. If that's true, then the primary thing psychotherapists ought to be doing is helping people develop their resources so that they can address their challenges in living and not being so symptom oriented. And another reason, of course, we have such challenges in living is because our contemporary cultures have decayed so deeply, so completely, thoroughly in many ways, psychologically and uh, socially and, and spiritually. We all have additional difficulties because we're living in unhealthy communities and we don't have the inner resources that we would have developed and cultivated if we had grown up in healthy communities. I can backtrack and use an example you gave to illustrate missing the mark that I think Western psychology makes. So you go on a vision fast and you have an authentically connected experience with a butterfly. And because your species system is set up to communicate with other species through voice and thought, the butterfly communicates and the way you receive the communication is the butterfly speaks words to you. Mm -hmm. I imagine that you and I would take that factually and it wouldn't seem so odd. On the other hand, our profession would take an experience like that and do probably one of two things. Well, you'd fasted for a few days, so you were having some kind of delusory states and (laughs) you shouldn't put any stock in that. Or they would then go the symptom route and they'd say, ah, well, you know, the age you were at, it's possible you started to have some kind of psychotic experiences and so on, so on so on. I just think it's important as we're doing this to kind of keep pointing at how the unhealthiness that we're talking about in our culture really has been helped along by the way the medical model and the psychological model sort of views humans, their capacities, and our experience in such a limited way, don't you think? I do agree that in contemporary terms, we'd say that It's our experience that every human has what might be called a mystical relationship with the world. Now, even saying that reveals some of the pathology of contemporary culture, that we'd have to call it mystical. Because in a healthy culture, it would be called, that's just what the world is. That we we have this uh, relationship that with the world in which everything is related to us, everything is kin, everything speaks everything breathes, everything is alive. And this is what we find in, as far as I can tell from my reading, in in all intact indigenous cultures. I'll remind our readers, probably most people know this too, that every single one of us listening to this and every single human ever born comes from a culture that was indigenous at one time. So we all come from people who didn't have to be taught that everything was alive. It was our experience from the beginning. I believe every human child, including contemporary Western children, have that natural instinct to treat everything as alive and everything speaks. And one of the fundamental faculties that we have as humans is our imagination. It might be our single most important capacity or faculty. And in the contemporary world, it is the most suppressed of our capacities for knowing the world. Even when it comes to verbal communication between humans, you can't really understand anybody without an enlivened imagination. Because just the words, just the sounds we're making with our vocal cords, they only will uh, relay so much meaning that we we need our, our emotional capacity to feel in the presence of another human and our interaction with them. And we need our imagination to help us understand what they're saying or what they're doing. So imagination is is an essential part of human communication and maybe one of the main reasons we end up with so much trouble communicating with each other is because our imagination is under cultivated because of the cultures we grew up in and the educational systems and the religious systems and so on Um, with an enlivened imagination we're able to understand Uh, the behavior and the communications of other than humans. We need that imagination, our enlivened, deep imagination to do that. And our psyches, of course, 
do all kinds of things for us without our ego being involved in any way whatsoever. Like the dreams we have every night, mm -hmm. the ego doesn't create that. Well, isn't that interesting? I wonder where there's something in our psyches that has this immense intelligence. This is just one example. One of the things our psyches do for us once our imagination is enlivened or cultivated is that when we're in the presence of other than humans, our imaginations will, you might say, translate for us. So you could say it's the, the muse, our inner muse, that will translate what others are saying. You know, we need our inner muse to even translate what other humans are saying much of the time. So a spruce tree or a butterfly, as in my case in my first cell encounter, were speaking to me and my muse was translating for me. And after four days of fasting, nothing unusual about that. But for a lot of people who have become what I call ecologically awakened, it's their everyday experience. You mm -hmm. go for a walk. We're not making stuff up. It's then the muse and our embodied somatic capacity for feeling will allow us to understand what's going on around us. That's why early in the book, you state vociferously that you feel what we've lost is this journey of soul initiation, which the profound beauty of this book is that this is not your attempt to just put forth another frame and say, well, here it is. This is your full on invitation to dive into the innate capacity of their organism, basically. Here's how to do this. Here's mm -hmm. a frame. Here's why you'd want to do this. <laughs> And there's lots of great examples through the book of what this journey of soul initiation looks like. Yeah, well, there's a few things to say about that. The first one is the journey of soul initiation is so lost from contemporary culture. It is so off our maps. It's so far off our maps that most people who are first exposed to these ideas, they either have a response of, I have no idea what you're talking about, Bill, or <laughs> and it's actually more common. Oh, I know exactly what you're talking about. And almost in every case, they're wrong. That's one way our human minds work is that when there's something new being presented to us, our, it's like our mind, our strategic mind immediately goes out and tries to like a filing system and asks ourselves, well, I wonder what version of the things I already know of this is. And it isn't. So for example, because we're talking here to uh, many whom are psychologists, it's essential to say at this point that the journey of soul initiation is not therapy. It is not a new form of therapy. It's not an old form of therapy. It's not a way of healing anything. And I'm not against healing or therapy. I'm a psychologist. <laughs> but this is something different. And I know a lot of the listeners are going to resist that. If it, if it helps us psychologically, it's a form of therapy. And I'd say, no, this is something different. In fact, let me sharpen the point here, Lisa. The journey of soul initiation is counter-therapeutic will undermine right. a person's adaptation to their social world and their vocational world. It'll pull the rug up from underneath them. Second disturbing point, that not just anybody can embark on the journey of soul initiation. Just wanting to is not enough. The conclusion I've come to is that approximately 80% of contemporary people are stuck in what I call early adolescence. And at least half of those aren't even in a healthy early adolescence. They're in an egocentric it's all about me, almost narcissistic adolescence. Maybe, you know, as many as half of the people alive in contemporary societies. But healthy early adolescence is a great stage to be in. I, I say in my book, Nature and the Human Soul, which outlines my whole stage model, that every stage is the best stage to be in. And I really believe that's true. When you're leaving any stage for the next one, that's a terrible thing that's happening. You're leaving the best stage that you ever were in. And it's going to take a while before you're enjoying the next stage. So careful what you ask for. The point I'm trying to get to now, Lisa, is that if it's true, if I'm anywhere close to correct that 80% of people in adult bodies are actually in the psychological stage of early adolescence, then that means 80% of contemporary people are not eligible, psycho-spiritually eligible or ready for the journey of soul initiation. It's not something you can just sign up for. You've got to get ready for it. Part of the new book is a sketch of the many dimensions of getting prepared for that. What I'm doing in that chapter of the new book is summarizing what's in my book, Wild Mind, which is a nature-based map of the human psyche. And it's a way of mapping onto nature's template what the innate facets of human wholeness are and how to cultivate them. And a reminder there that 
all four facets tend to be neglected, four facets of wholeness in the contemporary world. And two of them are not just ne neglected, but actively suppressed. Those are the ones that have to do with somatic embodiment capacities and our emotional intelligence and our deep imagination and our muse, our guide to soul, as I call it. So that's just background to say so far that the journey of soul initiation is not what you think it is. It's not what most people think it is. It's an initiation process that I believe every healthy culture has had in the past, that, that the few intact nature-based cultures that still exist on this planet, they have their version of it. And every healthy culture in the future will have their version of it. And in one sense, what I'm doing in the book, is, um, there's two aspects to it. And that is, it's providing a deep structure model of the journey of soul initiation as I would expect to find it in any culture, past, present, or future, if it's a healthy culture. But the second thing that's maybe even more important is that, that my colleagues and I have developed over the last 40 years a contemporary Western version of it. I want to emphasize this, Lisa, because one of the ways to misunderstand what we're doing is to say, oh, they're doing some Native American process, or they, they learned this from some indigenous people, and we haven't. Mm -hmm. uh, this is mostly based in Western mysticism and with some elements borrowed from cultures around the world, but only, we've only borrowed elements that we, you find almost everywhere, including our own Western traditions. I have many definitions of the journey of soul initiation, but here's one. It's a contemporary Western nature-based process for becoming a true adult or an initiated adult. Right. And what I mean by adult, that's another one of those words. I have a radically different definition of it. I don't mean what we mean in the Western world. My most shorthand definition is, four words, a visionary artisan of cultural evolution. All true adults are people who are visionaries, who have a mystical relationship to this world, and are, by embodying their unique ecological niche, their soul, they are uh, contributing their piece to the regeneration of our contemporary cultures. It's wonderful to hear you defining these terms extemporaneously. <laughs> In the book, you probably took a lot of effort and time to make it really clear. So for instance, I think rather than saying what is an adult or an elder, you use the word true in front of it. I actually think this is important for people mm -hmm. to do the translation. And mm -hmm. it's the true part for me that gives the definition as according to you, someone who knows why they were born. Mm -hmm. How many people, you know, they just go through life with a sense of meaninglessness. They don't really have a sense of why they're here, what they're supposed to do. And someone who knows that they are a unique participant in the web of life. Mm -hmm. And I actually think a lot of us, because of the narcissism that you point to, that uniqueness, it, I don't think it's a narcissistic uniqueness that you're pointing at. I feel, again, it's knowing how you could be of service, how you fit in, how you can contribute, how you can connect and get guidance from the world, from your embodiment in the world about how you can connect. And then someone who takes all of that knowledge and manifests it creatively in what they do in life. And this is a part of the book that I thought was very interesting, where you make this distinction between what the culture tells us we're supposed to do and is valuable to do and what the journey of soul initiation and descent, as you call it, will inform us about what we're really here to be doing, what really is a contribution. In the contemporary world, we put such an emphasis on our thinking abilities, or we might say our strategic minds, we believe we are supposed to figure out what we're supposed to do in life. On a soul level, it's, it's never figured out, it's, it's discovered. Mm. Uh, it's not invented, it's discovered. It's something we were born to do, or you could say it's the person we were born as, uh, and we need to go through an initiatory process with or without outer guides to not only discover what, who we were born to be, but have our consciousness shape-shifted so that we're actually able to do that. This is probably, good be a good point to say that when we have an encounter with soul during a what I call a descent to soul, which is part 
of the journey of soul initiation. When we have a soul encounter, we don't get some kind of literal description of an ecological niche. Um, that's not the way it works. It's In fact, it's basically impossible to describe the ecological niche of any species. What a niche is, is the full set of relationships that that species or that individual has with everything else, especially in its ecosystem. That's such a web. It's not really possible just to describe definitively in ecological terms. The way it works for us humans is, I believe, is that when we have a, a glimpse of our unique ecological niche, we're actually having experience of a metaphor. It's an image or um, a poetic phrase or a pattern that holds this sense of what my unique place is. I already gave an example for me. I've had several soul encounters, but my first one was this idea of weaving cocoons, that that is my place. That's my niche in the world, to weave cocoons of transformation or to help others weave cocoons of transformation for themselves. In particular, transformation from adolescence to true adulthood. Notice that that butterfly didn't say as it went by, hey, Bill, you're going to be a psychologist or you're going to be a vision fast guide or you're going to write books or you're going to be a psychotherapist. Because those are all cultural terms, social roles and vocations. And if you think about it, we can't be born with that kind of knowledge because that kind of knowledge, like psychologist or vision fast guide or soul craft guide even, that's in cultural terms. But cocoon weaver, that's an ecological term. So that's a mythopoetic translation. Oh, by the way, that's the phrase I wanted to bring in here. Mythopoetic yes. identity. Something like cocoon weaver is a mythopoetic identity. And it's the way through that kind of identity that we understand our ecological. I want to contrast that with the way we tend to think of purpose and meaning in the contemporary world, which is an early adolescent understanding of purpose and meaning. That's not a criticism. That's not a put down in the psychological stage of early adolescence that begins after puberty and who knows if it ever ends for any given person. But in that stage, we have this psychological task of creating consciously a persona, a social presence that's at least somewhat different than the world system or the value system our parents brought us up in. Um, but we, we're, like, we're creating our own drama we're determining what kind of roles do I want in the drama of my life and which persons am I going to assign to which of those roles? This is creating a, a social presence. And the task in my model of human development, the task of early adolescence is to create such a social presence that's both authentic and socially acceptable to your peer group. Part of that is developing a sense of purpose, of social purpose or meaning, early job or career. And so most people talk about purpose or meaning. They're talking about what is my career going to be? What are the kinds of activities or social roles that bring me meaning? Or what is my gender identity or my form of sexuality that brings me meaning? Or what's my religious faith that I resonate with? These are all essential kinds of questions for early adolescence. And that's what a person in that stage means by purpose and meaning. But one of the things that happens when we move to the next stage, which the fourth stage in my model of eight stages, the fourth stage I call the cocoon, not surprisingly, and the um, third stage of early adolescence that I call the oasis, the healthy version is oasis. But when we move to the cocoon, not only does our old purpose and meaning and identity fall away, but that whole template, the whole framework for what counts as identity and meaning and purpose falls away. When we move into the cocoon, go through the passage of what I call confirmation, um, we know we'll never be able to identify ourselves in any satisfying way in terms of a job, a career, a religious orientation, or a social role. Very different. Yeah, it's very different because I think we'll both agree that our profession sees that task as part of being mentally healthy, healthy human being. So. Here you are saying, well, that's obviously important because we have to contribute to our culture. And you're also saying there's a point at which there's some questioning about the validity in terms of how rich really is that? <laughs> is this all I am? Which I think is where psychology starts to fail people. When you start to move into what you call this cocoon, yeah, the cocoon is what I think I've said it corresponds in my model to late adolescence. And as we make that passage, again, I call it confirmation from the oasis 
to the cocoon that's early to late adolescence. As I say, we lose our faith that we're ever deeply identify ourselves in social or vocational terms. And that's a psycho-spiritual crisis. In a healthy culture, the elders are right there yeah. or the uh, adult initiators are right there. And they take you aside and they say, here's what's going on for you. Whereas in our culture, if you start getting really confused and disoriented and wanting to spend a lot of time alone with poetry and your journal out wandering on trails, and people start worrying about you, and they let you know they're worrying about you, and you start worrying about yourself because no one ever explained to you what is going on, and someone suggests you go see a psychotherapist, and if that psychotherapist is not an, an initiated adult, they won't know what's going on for you either. And with the best of intentions and really well-honed tools, they'll end up probably supporting you to abort the journey of soul initiation. Yeah, I'm sorry. My heart just sank, even just yeah. hearing you say that. Yeah, it's disturbing. We've lost that. But and some of my people might think this is a crazy idea or I'm trying to, I'm wanting to go backwards in time and human evolution when I say things like all intact uh, nature-based indigenous traditions have had initiation processes. And there's not just one initiation in life. In our contemporary world, when we think of initiation, we think of the model of puberty rights, which is an initiation, absolutely, from childhood into adolescence. It's not childhood into adulthood. We've got these two stages of adolescence in between, but that's not the first initiation in life. Birth for sure is an initiation and there are healthy cultures have initiation rights for the whole family at the time of birth. And then there's something that all psychologists of course know that happens approximately at the end of our fourth year or into our third year of life that we become conscious of ourselves. The man who wrote the book, The Rites of Passage in French, Arnold Van Genep, he called that passage naming. And we hardly even recognize it in the contemporary world. That's a major initiation from basically not having an ego that's online to having one that's, and we're aware of ourselves. And then puberty is the next initiation. And then moving into late adolescence, confirmation is, is yet another one. But the cocoon stage, late adolescence in my model, the entire stage is an initiatory process. One difference, one of the other ways to say the difference between humans and the other species, as far as we know, um, the other species get to adulthood. It's all biologically guided. As far as we know. As yeah. far as we know. Yeah. Maybe we'd say this, that it's something like 90 plus percent of species aren't even raised, shall we say, with parents. The parents give birth and then they're gone. Individuals on their own. And which suggests that we're every individual of every species born, not just with the capacity to be a version of its species, but with the knowledge of how to do that. Absolutely. And you could say that's in the DNA. You yes. could say it's in the morphogenetic field of the species. You can say it however you wish, but the knowledge base is something when you're born in that organismic form, you got it. But if we look around at human traditions, around the world, it seems that all healthy cultures have had an initiatory process that was necessary, or at least highly beneficial to help an individual get to the adult stage of, of being human. It's not clear that other species have social slash cultural initiation processes that result in adulthood. But with us humans, if you remove those initiatory processes, the ones that get us to adulthood, then relatively few people ever make it. Some do anyways. For example, Carl Jung did. Probably everybody who's listening to us today, they know about the Red Book and the experience he went through that he called his confrontation with the unconscious, which he also writes about, dedicates a whole chapter to in his memoir, Memory, Dreams, Reflections. And he had no guide and no map of initiation and didn't know what was going on and suspected he was having a psychotic break somehow managed to get through it without any map and any outer guide. But as we know, he had inner guides and he was able to access his inner guides because his window of imagination was unusually well-developed for a contemporary Western man. Yeah. And through his imagination, he was able to access this sequence of guides, Elijah, Salome, Philemon, Ka, and many others actually along the way, including the serpent. He did get through it. Now, one conclusion one might make, our human psyches include, you might say, that map or those instructions that there's something in us that knows 
how to go through this initiatory process. But with humans, we're much more likely to go through it successfully with elders, our initiation guides who understand the terrain and can guide us. But some of us get through it without any outer guides. It's built in and yet our guides become the culture. So the culture is disrupting us and showing us all kinds of other initiatory rights, which aren't necessarily connecting to being a whole human. And I think another thing you point out, which I loved, there's a certain point in the book where you start to talk about the role of quote unquote inner protectors, which are actually not doing a very good job of anything other than distracting you from the descent journey. And I actually thought it might be interesting for you to maybe talk a little bit about how what I call grasping a trauma identity and these other things get in the way of what you've pointed to as a really difficult period of transitioning out from what's expected or what you think is expected for you. Maybe at least three things there. <laughs> no, that's great. I actually jotted down a couple of notes, so I might be able to stay on track here. First thing is to make another one of the distinctions that we commonly don't make in the contemporary Western world, and that has to do with rites of passage. The journey of soul initiation is not a rite of passage. Rites of passage, there's two kinds of passages, two sets of rites of passage. One passage is a change in social status, like being someone doesn't have their first smartphone to being someone who does, or from being a high school student to a college student, or from being a, a religious novice to a priestess. These are changes in social role, including religi religious or vocational role. And you can have a rite of passage that not only supports you to go through that change, but actually makes the change happen. Somebody like Chief Justice of the Supreme Court says, put your hand on the Bible, Joe Biden. And at the end of that little ceremony, Joe Biden, who had only been the president-elect, is now the president. And he really is the president. And that's a social rite of passage. And it made him president. He wouldn't have been president otherwise, unless he had been sworn in. But there's another kind of passage that's entirely different. And those are passages from one stage of life to the next, like from childhood to early adolescence. That passage is called puberty. And if you have a ceremony to support you in that passage, it would be called a rite of passage and have a particular name depending on the cultural context. Oh, here's the thing about those rites of passage. They don't create the passage. The rite of passage doesn't make you an adolescent, that you've already gone through the passage of from child to adolescence is largely biologically supported, but it's also psychosocially supported. But you didn't decide to become an adolescent. The way I like to say it is that mystery says you're ready to go into this new psychosocial stage of adolescence. Mm -hmm. It's not just a matter of physical puberty, those somatic sexual changes, that some people go through that psychosocial change of puberty as early as age 10, some not until 16 or so. But when it happens, it's not because you or your elders or your parents or anyone else decided. You can have a rite of passage, but it won't make you an adolescent unless you've already shifted. These kinds of rites of passage do is they ceremonially mark the fact that a passage has already happened and they provide guidance for the individual because it essentially the elders are saying, your center of psycho-spiritual gravity is moving from childhood now to early adolescence. It's a very, very different consciousness and it's a very different world. The rite of passage is to support you in understanding what's going on for you and, and to begin to help you adjust to this new stage of life. In addition, the rite of passage is telling the whole community, someone in our midst is going through this big change. They're going to need some help. And also, by the way, you now want to treat them in a manner appropriate to their new stage and not the old stage in order to support them in this shift. So again, just to underline it, the social passages or the vocational change in status is brought about by the rite of passage. But when it comes to changing stages of life, the rite of passage does not bring it about. So in the contemporary men's movement, for example, it's believed that you can go through a certain rite of passage on a weekend in the woods with drums and you will be an adolescent beforehand and you'll be a man afterwards. And by the way, I think those, the programs that are doing those kinds of things are it's doing beautiful yes. work and, and they're helping men become more whole. It's really 
the cultivation of wholeness and the creation of community in a, in a context, among other things, where men can actually talk about their feelings and, and be real with each other and so on. It's, it's a therapeutic experience, among other things. So I'm not dissing those weekends in any way whatsoever, but that's not what makes an adult person. What does that, I believe, in any healthy culture is what I call the journey of soul initiation. I didn't make this stuff up. I just used some English language for it and tried to map out the patterns that we find cross-culturally for this particular initiatory process. It's not a rite of passage. It's a process of initiation. It's not a passage from one stage of life to another, but it's the multi-year long process of initiation that happens within a stage of life, which is the one I call the cocoon. And then, Lisa, you asked about inner protectors. That's a, one of the phrases I use. Another one is subpersonalities. For those parts of our psyches that they develop in childhood independently of the ego to protect us from getting any more hurt physically or psychologically than we would have been otherwise. They're generally suspicious of any kind of major changes. So if we're going through this confirmation passage, if we're starting to move from the oasis to the cocoon, they will try to keep that from happening because they know it's going to really upset the apple cart of our lives in every way. And they'll try to keep it from happening. The kind of person who can resist that protection, that inner protection, that attempt at inner protection, is one who's developed a fair amount of their wholeness and is one who has succeeded at the tasks of early adolescence, which is to say they've discovered their personality level authenticity and a way to be authentic in their peer group. But even once we get into the cocoon in the contemporary world, we often need additional help in cultivating our wholeness before we're actually ready for the descent. Otherwise, yes. we'll get derailed by our inner protectors or our outer protectors <laughs> and therapists. And therapists, yes. And I've never seen anybody point to the attachment to trauma identity mm -hmm. that patients have and that particularly trauma therapists actually have because that's mm. the only thing they know how to work with they just keep emphasizing that the trauma identity is who you really are even though if i said that to a trauma therapist of which i am one honestly they would probably laugh at me and say well i'm not saying that at all it's something no one ever does in trauma therapy is make that leap for people well this isn't really who you are. These are the protective mechanisms that were created. And it's a fallacy. It's a false sense of what the world actually is, which mm -hmm. is dangerous, which, you know, honestly, if you look at it from wholeness, the world is not dangerous. The world is your home, literally. We probably agree, Lisa, but I, I would say the world is actually dangerous in just the right kinds of ways. And sometimes in unfortunate ways. And safety is overemphasized in the contemporary world. The descent to soul, which again is that core experience that happens at least once during the journey of soul initiation, and by the way, can happen again afterwards. Um, and the descent to soul itself, generally taking at least a few weeks and often many months or over a year. Okay, so the descent to soul um, is dangerous. But not yeah. in the way the protectors imagine danger. That's oh, the thing. Totally. Yeah. Completely I, the, different. The things I've learned about trauma that make most sense to me, it seems to be the as Western therapists, we have learned so much about trauma. It's amazing. Um, but one of the uh, people I've read on trauma is the Canadian physician, Gabor Maté. Mm -hmm. Much of what he says resonates really strongly with me. But the one I want to mention here is he makes this distinction, I believe other trauma therapists do too, that trauma is not the thing that happened to us in the past. It's not the overwhelming experience, that terribly devastating, catastrophic, emotionally difficult experiences that happened in the past. Uh, Maté says that the Trauma is actually what we do inside ourselves, almost always unconsciously, to protect ourselves from the full onslaught of that experience in the past. Right. The terms I use to speak of what we do inside ourselves, which, among other things, results in our emotional and somatic numbing to protect ourselves from horrible experiences in the past, that's the work of what I call our inner protectors or our sub personalities. And the primary subpersonality when it comes to protecting ourselves from trauma are escapists, which include our addicts. They want to protect the ego from the full experience of what actually happened. 
And it's the right thing to do because we don't have the resources yet. And if we're in that trauma identity, as you call it, which I just say, if we're hijacked by a subpersonality, inner protector, if we're consciously identified with our escapist, then we'll never be able to assimilate that traumatic experience that happened sometime in the past. Um, and until we do, we won't be healed. But as therapists, if we're working with someone who's hijacked by their escapist, they're in that trauma identity, any attempt to have that person revisit the traumatic experience in the past will be re-traumatizing. So we first have to help the person cultivate their wholeness and get into that centered place. And I call it the self, capital S, not quite the same thing that, that Jung meant, but similar. And once a person is centered in their wholeness, in their self, then they can revisit those experiences and not only assimilate and heal from it, but quite possibly discover something that will support their journey of soul initiation. It actually can become a contributor to their further individuation. Well, of course, because that process is a descent to go beyond trauma identity, the expectations of it, the view of it. It's not nearly what you're describing as a descent to soul, obviously. But it is a similar process. Even the structure, your five phases, is very similar. This mm. preparation and then the dissolution of it and then the encounter with who you really are. And then this shifting, the transformation of, wow, there's this other thing I really am. Mm -hmm. And then the enactment of who you really are in the world. Mm. I mean, honestly, when I was reading <laughs> the five phases of the descent to soul, I thought, Wow, no wonder this is so important for that preparatory phase before you can even think about going on a soul journey to actually do that work of unwinding the attachment, the grasping at who you think you are, which is mm -hmm. not who you actually are. If you're someone, yeah. particularly someone who had lots of forms of early childhood, either developmental or environmental trauma. Wow, Lisa, that's fascinating. I hadn't thought of that before, that applying the model of the five phases of what I call the descent to soul to um, trauma therapy. Um, one thing I've discovered, it seems to be a pattern, as we move into later stages of life, with the way I've come to understand those stages, we're able to reach deeper layers of trauma. Some people would have thought it would work the opposite, that we've got to do our trauma healing, that'll help us get to the next stage of life. And then we're not so much limited by trauma. But in fact, what I've found is that we're actually able to reach deeper layers of trauma. And that's often a necessary part of our progressing through the next stage of life. The more resourced we are, the deeper we can go, not only in our healing, but in our holding, in our capacity to serve the world. Sometimes what people do is they get to the point where they're contacting the collective trauma in yeah. their experience, and then they really begin to feel viscerally the way modern humans have been robbed of their wholeness. And that ends up being another level of healing that happens. Although again, I don't think it's the same process you're pointing to in mm -hmm. Descent to Soul. So one thing I'm realizing is the implication of what we're saying is that healing is often, and holding, are often a dimensions of the journey of soul initiation, but the primary thing that's happening is not healing. It's access of mystical relationship with the world. So yeah, the descent to soul, as you've already just beautifully outlined, Lisa, is the experience that results in soul encounter and our capacity to embody our soul's purpose. As you say, there's five phases and I've used two analogies to help people understand it. One is it's a whole canyon, like we're going down into a canyon. The preparation phase is walking you know, like through the forest until you get to the canyon edge. And then second phase is actually falling into the canyon or the descent, which I call dissolution. And then the third phase is being at the bottom, which is the actual encounter with soul. The fourth I call metamorphosis, which is coming back up the other side of the canyon when we're actually getting changed by the soul encounter psychologically. And then enactment, fifth phase, where we begin to embody for others who we discovered ourselves to be. But the second analogy is, of course, the caterpillar analogy. Probably obvious how that one came to me. The preparation phase is when the caterpillar is actually weaving its cocoon. If it's a moth caterpillar, and if it's a butterfly caterpillar, it has this biological brilliance of being able 
to turn its body into a chrysalis, which is essentially a cocoon. For us humans, preparation is a matter of, in my understanding, of cultivating our four facets of wholeness, doing whatever healing work we can with our inner protectors, and addressing any developmental needs from earlier stages. But then once the caterpillar is in the cocoon or chrysalis, then its body dissolves into caterpillar soup. It just literally dissolves. For the human, what that corresponds to is our identity, our psychosocial, yes. vocational identity dissolving. And that's terrifying for people, even when they do know what's going on and when they don't, that much more so. So as guides, we have all kinds of practices and frameworks to help people understand what's happening, not only keep from aborting that process, but actually amplifying it and intensifying it. The third phase, soul encounter for the caterpillar, that's after its its body has liquefied. And there are these cells that have been in the caterpillar body all along, biologists call imaginal cells. And those cells, the caterpillar's immune system has always been suppressing them. Just like in us humans, our inner protectors, keeping our deep imagination from going too far towards our soul. But in that third phase, for the caterpillar, the imaginal cells wake up. They're not being resisted so much anymore. You might say they have the image of butterfly or a moth body, of, of flight. And for us humans, that soul encounter phase corresponds to that revelation or that vision. In my case, it was weaving cocoons. For Carl Jung, it had to do with recognizing he had a special relationship with the dead. One of his tasks in life was to help his fellow humans be in relationship to the dead slash the unconscious in a way they weren't being as much as they needed to be. Then the fourth phase, in some ways, that's the most important phase. We often say that at Animus because we didn't realize that that phase even existed for a long time. We had thought in the early days that when you have a soul encounter like Kuhn Weaver, that's primarily information. You got the message, you hang up the phone, you go home and you start weaving cocoons and it doesn't work. And if you try to do that, we discovered by seeing people almost self-destruct, you could end up in a really bad place and, and be in a suicidal place. And I have one of the stories in my book is of a woman who tried to manifest her vision too soon. And so we tell people now, consider it's going to be several months, if not years of being in the metamorphosis phase. And what's happening there is the vision is actually shape-shifting your ego. And that takes some time. You're being shape-shifted from an adolescent ego where you're an agent for yourself to an adult ego where you're an agent for the world or for mystery or for soul. And that takes some time. And we've been developing practices that help people go through metamorphosis. And what's happening in, for the caterpillar is the Imaginal cells are creating a butterfly or a moth out of the recyclable materials of a former caterpillar. We're doing something similar, but it's not a change in our body so much. And then when the butterfly or moth body is formed well enough, the cocoon breaks open or the adult now breaks out of the cocoon, but it doesn't just fly. It needs to hang around for a while just outside the cocoon and pump fluid through its wings to fill out the wing structure and then flap its wings for quite a while. That's literally the metaphor of stretching our wings. And only after a while can it actually fly and then the adult butterfly or moth work of pollination and procreation. Yes. So for humans in the fifth phase enactment, we need to start doing our best to embody who we discovered we are, even though we don't have a delivery system. We don't have a, a cultivated method for doing it. We just wing it. And that helps the metamorphosis go deeper. And then once we move into early adulthood, that's going through the passage of soul initiation, then one of our tasks is to identify at least one delivery system for our soul work. We identify a delivery system and then we study with a master of that system. We study with someone who already has developed a delivery system that will work well enough for our particular soul work. It's so wonderful that the system you developed is a true adult that it was able to see where it couldn't see itself and then appropriately step in and change the model to include something that would make the outcome actually really workable. My hat is off to you for that. But yeah, you know, I started out using models from others like Ben Genep's model of rites of passage and Joseph mm -hmm. Campbell's model of the hero's journey and use that to orient myself in guiding others. And gradually I realized it wasn't working. There right. were some things that were wrong about it and in applying it to this journey of soul initiation or the descent to soul. So mostly what my colleagues and I did is we 
offered our attention really, really carefully to people we were guiding who were going through this kind of process and asking ourselves, what are the patterns? What, yeah. what are the experiences of these people showing us of how it works? You know, I'd say it's not so much we developed the model, we just took careful notes and articulated it. Yes, well, all artists will tell you everything is appropriation. Yeah. Meaning it's important to appropriate from what's come before and then to have the ability to see either this isn't right or this needs to be different. That's when the creation of your own thing from things that have already existed mm -hmm. happens. What I was pointing at was the lack of immature ego in the way you and your colleagues have gone about creating this model. It's uh -huh. very much an enactment of everything that you're trying to teach. Yeah, I'm being regularly challenged and overwhelmed by the challenges. This is something that's true about soul initiation. I think everybody I know has had a similar experience. Like even the soul encounter, when we get this sense of what we are to do in the world in this ecological or mythopoetic sense, yes. we feel it's the greatest blessing that could possibly have happened to us. And at the same time, it's a horrible burden. It's a violation. I could never be enough to bring this into the world. I am totally incapable. There's this tendency to collapse. And, and But gradually, we start learning the lesson that the ego hasn't created this, and the ego is not the primary vehicle. Mm. Um, the ego is, is just there to shape a delivery system, but the real juice is coming from somewhere else. Would it be okay if I read another quote from your book? You bet. This one is about the relationship between ego and soul. And you write, the healthy, mature ego is our means for making real our soul's desires. This is why it's often said there's a love affair between the ego and soul, and that when they come together in partnership, they form a sacred marriage. Each has what the other lacks and what the other longs for and is deeply allured by. The soul holds the knowledge of our true destined place in the world, of what is truly worth doing with our lives. But the soul has no means, no head or hands to manifest that purpose. It is the healthy, mature ego that can construct things and accomplish things in the world. The soul is spellbound by the ego's capacity to manifest. The ego is moonstruck by the soul's visions and passions. The mature ego wants more than anything in life to make real the dreams the soul has been weaving since before our birth. Such a gift, this book. Thank you. It's been a blessing and a horrendous burden to, to write it. <laughs> well, I think trailblazers often have that experience. Yeah. And we're all, I believe, designed and born to be trailblazers of our own sort. When you get enough trailblazers, again, I call them visionary artisans of cultural evolution in the same community and working together and supporting each other and competing in a really healthy, supportive way with each other and coming up with um, new delivery systems while they work together. That's, for me, how a healthy culture grows organically through the interactions of true adults and elders in relationship to all the other species and forms and forces of the earth community. I know this is going to be a terrible question and you don't have to answer it. <laughs> I have this sense it's possible people listening have this question coming up for them. If there was something a person wanted to do to set out on this journey, they're inspired in some way to go beyond the accepted norms or conditions of their life, what would you recommend as a first step? Well, you know, it might depend on which stage the person is in. If they're having that feeling, they're at least in a healthy early adolescence, the oasis, or they might be early on in the cocoon. Two things that, that would be helpful for a person in either stage, I call them uh, unplugging from the matrix and romancing the world. Probably everybody gets the sense, whether you saw the matrix movies or not, what unplugging from the matrix means. I mean, our contemporary I call it conformist consumer society, which you might say does everything it can to keep us in a juvenile state of consciousness, wanting to conform and get ahead and compete and consume as if that's what life is all about. So unplugging from the matrix means that 
Um, especially if you're asking these deeper questions about meaning and purpose, that means unplug from most forms of entertainment, uh, obviously advertising, most form of entertainment is advertising, withdraw from the kind of social interactions that keep you on a surface level. Since we're psychotherapists here and talking to many psychotherapists, let's acknowledge that in what I call early adolescence, which most people would call everyday life after puberty, at any age, our social connections, our social network is as important as anything for our psychological health. Absolutely essential. And during this past year of COVID, we're seeing a lot of people collapse psychologically because they're socially isolated. Social isolation is a bad thing, an unhealthy thing for people in early adolescence and childhood. But once you're in the cocoon, it's a necessary thing to some degree to, as I call it, unplug from the matrix. That social isolation then supports your development at that point, where earlier it would have been devastating. So we have all these stories of indigenous traditions around the world. When the journey of soul initiation is about to begin, the elders or the initiators come by and they take you out of the village and they bring you either into a initiatory camp for some number of months, or you're sent out alone onto the land social isolation. It's devastating for psychological health earlier in life. If you're not sure you're in the cocoon and not in a, a well-developed cocoon, then you don't want to socially isolate. But if you are ready for the descent, then withdrawing from everyday uh, social interactions, you wouldn't be going to parties every night post-COVID at least. And the other half of it is we at Animus call Romancing the World, which is to be out in the other than human world as much as possible. One of the practices we suggest is praising the others in the other places uh, out loud, and maybe even memorizing poems that help you praise the world, giving yourself to the world and being this human animal who you know is doing its human version of weaving a cocoon for itself. When you feel like you're ready for the descent, unplug from the matrix, romance the world. And unplug from the matrix doesn't mean if you're a parent of, of children, doesn't mean abandon your children. It doesn't mean leaving your job if you need to earn a living in order to support yourself and others. But it means um, if you have to still be in the everyday world, you'd want to be of it as uh, little as possible. Is there anything we haven't talked about that you want to make sure we do since we're coming to the end of our time together? The one thing I always try to remember to say is that even though the kind of process I'm describing may seem unfamiliar to you, namely the journey of soul initiation and in particular the descent to soul, it's not necessarily as difficult as it might seem. When it comes to the realm of spirituality, it might be a relatively easy Thing. Like you can get through this process in a, of the journey of soul initiation in three, five years, maybe even less, especially if you have guidance. I basically want to encourage people that it doesn't have to become your, your whole life 24 hours a day, but with some guidance and focus, things can uh, relatively rapidly. The second piece of encouragement is to say that I'm absolutely convinced that each of us are born with the capacity to go through this and are meant to go through this kind of journey. We have our inner guides as well as outer ones. Uh, we have the, what we call the intra-psychic structures to support us through this. That the path is already there and it's been, by the way, outlined in myths and cultures all over the world. I don't have the same reading as Joseph Campbell does on those mm -hmm. myths, but that kind of support, that mythic support is there um, within us and in the world. So if people want to get in touch with you or the Animus Valley organization, how do they do that? www.animus.org. Animus is the Spanish word for souls. It's A-N-I-M-A-S. Well, I so appreciate you taking the time to share your wisdom with us today. I really Thank appreciate you, it. Thank you, My pleasure. Thanks for the invitation and the conversation. Thanks for listening to today's show. To get in touch, please visit brownlessground.com. Let's dedicate our efforts to the healing of our planet and all its inhabitants. See you next time on the Groundless Ground.